This might be one of the single most important theological concepts that a Christian can understand is forgiveness of sins. Because if you don't understand forgiveness of sins, or at least have a, a working knowledge of it, at least give it a thought, then there's a really good chance due to the fact that we're human and we carry a human nature with us, that we're going to feel a weight and a guilt and a condemnation and a shame for sin that's going to choke the life right out of us. And the whole point of following Jesus, Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundant. It's not so that you might be depressed and dragged through life and hate this place and can't wait to go home. No, it's so that you might have life. Not life when you die, but life when you died in Christ. And that's impossible as far as I'm concerned if you live guilty every day. There's no way you're going to enjoy life if you drag around feeling as if God is perpetually against you for the stuff you've thought, said, done, or didn't do. And so being released from sin, as far as I can see, is the most important thing that can happen in the early stages of your development. Because if you can let go of this early, you can let go of the weight and the sin that so easily besets you, and you can realize I'm forgiven, that I'm loved well, then you're, the, the, a whole expanse opens up for you. The horizon of the rest of your life changes because you can leave the past in the past. Now, that doesn't mean you don't carry baggage and you don't carry scars and pain that he continues to work on. And I want to make sure from the very beginning today, I parse the difference between carrying sin as a guilt and carrying scars and wounds that have happened to you. Those are two different things. Okay, so carrying guilt is just feeling like you're not forgiven. I, I hope we can let go of that today. That's my attempt. Help you let go of that feeling like I'm never going to get over what I've done. That's different than a bunch of stuff was done to me. I, I've been wounded. I wounded myself. I'm, I'm carrying baggage. There's stuff in the basement, so to speak. There's stuff hidden under the bed. And I need this unpacked. That's different. And that's the ongoing process of living in Christ and having him go to work on you and heal you. Because some of that stuff was done to you. And some of that stuff you did to yourself. And some of that stuff was just life. It's just unfair. And it's just the way it is and it stinks. But he doesn't leave you in it. He doesn't forsake you and go, well, you know, too bad. <laughs> uh, someday you get to heaven and I'll be gone. No, he's, it's better than that. It doesn't have to be someday when I die, I'll get over this stuff. Although, good news, when we do slip this, we get over this stuff. But he's better than, than to just leave us and say, you know, I'll see you in 30 years when you get home or whatever. And so please understand the difference. And I try to get, that, get us there today is, is we don't have to carry the spiritual guilt of our sin. We don't have to carry the weight of it because Christ has taken care of it. And all the other stuff that we carry, he's in the process of working on in our lives. Okay, so... I don't want to get to the bottom today of um, why I'm forgiven. I, th that, that gets us into the roads of the cross and the blood, and we, we have to talk about that a little bit, but I don't want to go too deep down that theological rabbit hole of why I'm forgiven or what I needed forgiven from. I just want to get to the... Because, because in reality, the why is the prerogative of the forgiver. Um, I, I could say, God, why are we forgiven? And the, the truth is, is I don't need to know why. I just need to say yes. I can't understand why he forgives me, knowing what I know about me, but I'm thankful he forgives me. So this is one of those I don't need to understand the fullness of why or how, but just to trust that it's mine. And in doing that, I got to soak you today. This is a garden. This is a, one of those moments in the garden where we got to turn the sprinklers on. Okay, sometimes you got to get soaked. Today, I want to soak you in scripture because you'll notice sometimes I get up, read one passage. We talk it out, maybe add one here and there, sprinkle a little bit more in my real heart is like 700 scriptures. That's what I want to do. I want to just re I, I'm, I'm a maniac for like we need every time I do it. I think, well, I, I got seven more we could put right here. Let's just do 12 scriptures right here. That'll wear them out. And I try not to do that because I don't want to wear you out. I want to lift you up. I don't want you to leave and go, God, I dread. I'm not going back next. What do we got to do next weekend that we can avoid that? And so I try not to do that because people can be excited. I can be all excited about scripture and you're just like, man, I can't keep up with this. I don't know. So I get it. But today's the soaking. Okay. Today I'm going to turn the sprinklers on and hit you with scripture. If you can't make it to all of them, that's okay. Jot them down. 
Jot them down, read them at home, and say, I can't, I can't turn that fast. If it was a day where I had a screen, I'd just be screen, just bullet scriptures at you, man. We'd just go crazy. So I apologize in advance is why I'm doing that. I want to meet you in Ephesians chapter 1. We're going to do two from Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus before we move on. I don't want to make it sound like it's just going to be a constant turn fest, but there are going to be a few moments in here where I, I probably get out in front of you just a little bit on Scripture turning, and that's okay, all right? Um, on your way there, I want to remind you that forgiveness of sins, we're doing this because we're in the Apostles' Creed, and in the Apostles' Creed, we talk in the last third, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, okay? And the reason why forgiveness of sins lands right there, and this is important as far as I'm concerned, is the church and the community and then forgiveness of sins because forgiveness of sins, and this runs contrary to a lot of the stuff I come up thinking about individual salvation. Forgiveness of sins is best personified in community. Notice it wasn't, I believe in forgiveness of sins, the church, community. It was the church, community, forgiveness of sins because if you really want to understand what it means to be forgiven, you got to walk in a community that doesn't hold you guilty. And so this is what's hurting a lot of us in church situations is we're not walking in communities that don't hold us not guilty. They, they, everybody's always holding our sin in front of us. So we come to church and they, show, they remind us what we did and we go, I'm not going back. I'm sick of this. Of course you're sick of it because you're, it's supposed to be a place where forgiveness of sins is realized, not where forgiveness of sins is made unaccessible. So inside a community is the real revelation of forgiveness of sins. So that when you come together and set in this space, you should have a greater revelation. I'm really forgiven. I'm in a room with people who love me, who care for me, who accept me as I am. I can be the real me. And the real me is sometimes rotten. The real me is sometimes nasty. The real me sometimes don't tell the whole truth. But this group doesn't cut me off and tell me that I don't belong or that I got to clean up before I can. That, that's like having to clean up before I can get in the bath. What's the point? And so just being released into being who I am, that happens perfectly in community. And one of the places where this is exemplified the most is in the Lord's Prayer. You've been praying this your entire life. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. Or forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who've trespassed against us. Or forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Why all the ors? Because we've got different translations. But at the end of the day, sins, trespasses, debts, they're saying the same thing. Forgive us for what we've done as we forgive others who've done it to us. But be sure and realize that it's not Jesus saying only forgive me as I forgive others, but rather forgive me. May I know full forgiveness by forgiving others. So the very heartbeat of our, of our Lord's prayer is forgiveness of sins. To realize that we are forgiven and then are able to give it back. So Paul says it this way in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 7. In Him, and the Him is the Jesus Christ of verse Five, Okay, so in Jesus Christ, we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. So one of the very first principles today is for us to understand that we have forgiveness according to His grace, which means we have forgiveness by His choice, not by our choice. We have forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. How rich is God's grace? How big was your sin? How big was your sin? That's how rich God's grace is. In fact, Paul would say to the Romans that where iniquity abounds, grace does superabound, which means that wherever I have a lot of failure, I can be assured he has a lot more grace. Or another way of saying, wherever I've messed up, I can be sure he can outforgive me. <laughs> I can't outsin the amount of his forgiveness because it was never an earned forgiveness. It was a grace gift. Grace gifts can't be understood. In fact, they're supposed to be irrational. Jesus tells the story of a group of men who are hired early in the morning for a salary. And then a few hours later, a bunch more are hired. And a few hours later, a bunch more are hired. And then right before the, the final whistle, another group is hired. And he pays them in reverse. So he starts by paying the guys who worked one hour. And he gives them a full day's wage. 
And the guys at the beginning of the day go, ooh, he's changed his mind. He gave them a full day. I bet he's going to give us a bunch. Only to find that they get a full day's wage. And they're so mad because they got paid the same amount. And Jesus says the most crucial line about the grace of God, maybe in the entire Bible. Why are you upset if it's my father's prerogative to be good to whoever he wants to? Well, that's the message the church ought to be preaching every Sunday. Why would we be upset if it's God's prerogative to forgive whoever he wants to? To give grace and goodness to people who don't deserve it is the prerogative of the giver. And so forgiveness is a grace gift. Not an earned gift, not something I paid for, not something I pay for after I get it. I can't tell you why God is so good, but I'm glad God is so good. This is one of those I don't need to understand it things. Forgiveness is a gift of God's grace. And then go to chapter 4. Ephesians 4.32, because if you have a gift, it becomes important to be a giver. How many of you realize that it's more blessed to give than to receive? Right? Okay, that's a principle that's across time. So it would be more blessed to give forgiveness than to even receive forgiveness. And my goodness, it's good to get forgiveness. So imagine how good it is to give forgiveness. Well, Ephesians 4.32, Paul, same writer, same audience, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, Forgiving one another even as God in Christ forgave you. So according to Paul, forgiveness becomes something that I do in the same manner in which I got it. So how did I get it? Grace gift, didn't earn it. How much of it did I get? Way more than I could sin against. So how do I give it? Grace gift, they don't have to earn it. They don't even have to ask for it. So I'm, I'm, not, even, I'm not even allowed to wait around now as a follower of Jesus, on people to ask for forgiveness before I give it to them. Well, if they asked, I'd give it to them. That's not the way he forgave you. His forgiveness for you was a grace gift. Now, what we're going to learn in this today is that there's something we have to do with a gift in order to fully appreciate it, but there's nothing we have to do with a gift in order to make it a gift. It's still a gift. It's the prerogative of the giver to give it. It's the prerogative of the receiver to open it. But I can't stop God from giving forgiveness. And so, my responsibility then becomes to give forgiveness in the same way that I've received forgiveness. So we have it according to grace. We give it because we've accepted it. So you can't give what you haven't accepted. And this becomes the crux of the matter. And as far as I'm concerned, this is Paul's way of understanding the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who've sinned against us. It's Paul's way of saying we've received greatly let us give to the same proportion of which we've received. If we received greatly, then we would give greatly. If we haven't received much, then we wouldn't receive much or be able to give much. We can really only give what we have. So show me someone who refuses to forgive and I'll show you someone who refuses to accept forgiveness. So show me a believer who's struggling. Say, I just can't forgive this person. Then I'll show you that someone, and this isn't meant to be condemning, but I'll show you someone who at some area of their life refuses to accept the forgiveness of God for themselves. Because once you accept the forgiveness of God in the darkest spot in your heart, the place where you know you carry the most guilt, once you truly allow forgiveness to penetrate that spot, then no one else has enough darkness for you to keep unforgiven. Because every encounter that you have will just be measured against how much you've been forgiven. This is where judgment flies out the window. How can I judge this man knowing what I've done? Right? Or take, flip it. How can I not forgive this man knowing how forgiven that I am? And so we're here telling people, go forgive, forgive, forgive. Be like Jesus, forgive. But there can be no forgiveness given that is not first received because you can't give out of what you don't have. So as you know you are forgiven, you can then reciprocate. Because you're going to reciprocate something. It's the system of this world. You're either going to reciprocate what people give you. They give you anger, you give them anger back. They give you violence, you give them violence back. They reject you, you reject them. That's the way of the world, right? Tit for tat. Reap what you sow. Get what's coming to you. Karma. Comes around, goes around. (laughs) Good old way of the world, right? Comes around, goes around. Jesus steps in to to break that cycle. To say... That, and that's why it offends us when we really listen to Jesus go, well, I say to you, if a man strikes you on the cheek, turn to him the other one. It's Jesus saying there's going to have to be something in you that breaks the cycle of reciprocity, of paying people back. And the only thing that can be is forgiveness. But you can't do it if you don't know you don't have it. 
If you know you don't have it, if, if, you, if you don't possess it, hold on to it, how can you tear of what you have and hand off to someone else? This is a beautiful thing, too, because it's, there's no diminishment in it. If I have forgiveness and I give forgiveness, when I look down at my forgiveness, it's not lesser. I mean, if I had a ro- loaf of bread up here and I tore a piece off and handed it to you, my loaf of bread has less bread, right? That's natural world. Kingdom world, if I tear off of my forgiveness and hand it to you, I look down and my forgiveness is as big as it was when I tore off. There's no diminishment in the giver. That's the same with my peace, my joy. I don't lose In fact, you could say my my loaf gets a little fuller. (laughs) As I recognize that I'm giving it out, my joy gets fuller, my peace gets fuller, my my comprehension, my forgiveness gets fuller. So what's being asked of me is to give what I have. Listen, in essence, forgiveness is a death. When I came to this understanding, this was one of the single greatest revelations that I have ever received in learning to walk in forgiveness. Because I don't know if I'm good at it but I'm better than I was. I'm becoming more forgiving. I don't, I don't attempt, I don't ever anymore assume to have arrived at anything. (laughs) I've wrestled enough to know that I'm not as good as I think I am. (laughs) And, and, and I want to be more complete in him. But one of the things that's helped me in, in forgiveness is recognizing that forgiveness at its core is a death. Now, what I mean by that is that if I, if you've done something to me, and you come to me and ask for my forgiveness. I might want you to pay me back. I might want to get you back. If I forgive you, I have to die to the other things I would have received. I have to die to my need to be paid back. I have to die to my need to get you back. You see, that version of Paul dies right there, the minute I forgive. How I know I haven't forgiven is if that side of me doesn't die. If that side of me goes, yeah, you're forgiven, and I go, but you snake, I still hope you get what's coming to you. (laughs) Then I verbally forgave you, but I didn't die. I didn't, and this is what we mean by following Jesus. We're constantly stepping into his death. Jesus steps into death, goes, I'll self-sacrifice. And by stepping into his death, we're giving up the need for reciprocity. It's like Luke chapter 23, verse 34 And this is one to just have in your memory banks. In Luke 23, Jesus is hanging on the cross and he says, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. The text has admitted that Jesus has legions of angels in the invisible realm that can pull him off the cross. Guess what else they can do? Go to war with those stinking Romans that put him on a cross. He can can come to his fullness and, and show out with the sword in his hand. But instead, he says, Father, forgive them, because what Jesus does, he steps into the death of the cross rather than pick up the sword of reciprocity and defeat his enemies. And that's what he invites us into when he says forgive. To forgive, you have to give up the version of you that was going to be right, that was going to get his way, that was going to get payback. So I don't want to make forgiveness sound easy. I think one of the things we mess up with is go, hey, guys, it's easy. Just say I forgive you. That doesn't work. Just to say I forgive you doesn't work because it's just verbal. It required nothing of you. But forgiveness does cost because I step into the death of what I could have gotten if I hadn't forgiven you. Even if it was just the satisfaction of not forgiving you. The satisfaction of making you squirm. The satisfaction of knowing that you got to go to sleep at night knowing you wronged me. Ha ha. But to die to that means to step into what he's done for me. To recognize that he stepped into death and went, I'm not going to pay you back for what you've done wrong. I'm going to take what you've done wrong. And I'm going to pay for it. And I'm going to forgive you whether you like it or not. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Could sound like this. Father, they're so ignorant. They're so ignorant, they don't even know they need to ask for forgiveness. They're so ignorant, they don't even know they're doing anything wrong. So we're going to have to forgive them. Because if we wait around on them to figure it out, I can't save the world. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Father, forgive them. They're ignorant. Father, forgive them whether they ask for it or not. Forgive them whether they like it or not. Father, forgive them because forgiveness is why I'm dying. 
I'm dying to everything I could do to these people right now. I'm dying to everything I should do to these people right now. But I'm stepping into death. And all I want to give them in return is a blanket forgiveness. If that just even a little bit drops into your spirit as a fresh revelation, well, then that's a mustard seed's worth of forgiveness today. Like it might be the thing that gets you down the path to realizing you can let go. It, won't, it probably won't be enough, so let's, we soak it a little bit, okay? Now, I'm going to give you some scripture stories. You don't have to sit and read them. I recommend you go home and read them. But they're stories we need in this journey, okay? One of them occurs in Matthew chapter 18. In Matthew chapter 18 is the parable of the unforgiving servant, a parable that's come to mean a whole lot to me lately. The parable of the unforgiving servant sounds a little bit like this. I don't want to read it because I know if I read it and try to preach it, that's an hour by itself. And we don't have that kind of time. But the parable of the unforgiving servant is about a man who decides to go through his books and get what's coming to him. He's a bookkeeper. And he calls to him a man that owes him. Jesus uses a ridiculous sum of money. In our money, it's like $10 million. He calls a man to him that owes $10 million. Now, I don't know about your financial situation, but if I found out today that I owe $10 million, whoever told, proved to me I owed $10 million, I'd probably say, why don't you just go ahead and make it a billion because I'm gonna, not going to be able to pay that off either. I mean, you've picked a ridiculous number. I can't pay this off. So Jesus picks a ridiculous number. And they bring the man in that owes $10 million, And he says to the master, Please have mercy on me. I'm not going to be able to pay this back. And the master, you don't see this when you read it because it doesn't say it this way. This is why you got to see forgiveness as a death. The master dies right there to being a bookkeeper. Because at that moment, he closes the books. And he's like, you know what? You don't owe me anything. That's death to bookkeeping. I'm done keeping track of what you've done wrong. It's, it's what... Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.19, God reconciled the world to himself by not counting their transgressions against them. Hear that. God brought the world back by not counting. Just, just going, not going to count that. Not going to count what? All of it. That's the only way we're going to be able to move forward is if I just stop counting because you people won't stop sinning. <laughs> only way to win is just I'm just going to throw the pen down I'm not going to count anymore and so the man just oh thank you for forgiveness and it's a joyous story if it ends right there but it doesn't because our story doesn't end right there because our problem is other people <laughs> right if just other people would leave me and Jesus alone <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be fine but what I'm learning in life is my problem seems like it's other people, but it's really me. Okay? It's humorous to say it's other people, but the problem isn't other people. The problem is me because the man goes out and he encounters a guy that owes him a little bit of money. Jesus uses a little sum, like a month's worth of salary. It's pretty good, but it's not like going to, you know, you can do it. And the guy grabs him by the collar and says, I want what you owe me. And the man prays word for word the same prayer to him. He just prayed to his master. Please have mercy on me. And instead of having mercy as was given to him, he throws the man in debtor's prison and says, you'll stay here until you pay every penny. And word trickles back to the guy that forgave him. You know where the story goes, the 10 million, who calls him back in and goes, what have you done? You didn't give what I gave to you. So now you suffer at the hands of the same people that are torturing the man that owes you. What's the moral of the story? It's forgiveness unrecognized and unreceived can never be given out. No matter how great the forgiveness was, but because the man never died to bookkeeping, you got to die to bookkeeping if you're going to be a forgiver. Because he never died to bookkeeping, he never received the forgiveness of the one who died to bookkeeping. In Luke chapter 7, we get another story. Luke chapter 7 relates the story of Jesus going to a, 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 a Pharisee's house for dinner. And a woman, the Bible says she's a sinner, comes into the house. And she falls down at the feet of Jesus. 
And she begins to cry and she breaks a bottle of anointing oil and she pours it on Jesus' feet and she weeps on His feet and she dries His feet with her hair. And the Simon, the Pharisee, sits across the table thinking this woman and we got evidence that she's probably a prostitute. Whoever she is, she's a famous sinner. Everybody in town knows them, which has caused scholars to believe the woman in town that everybody knows that's a sinner was typically in that day a prostitute. And so here's a woman that everybody knows isn't living right, and yet she's washing Jesus' feet with her hair. And Simon the Pharisee thinks if he knew what kind of woman this was, he wouldn't accept her. And so Jesus says to Simon, you never washed my feet when I came into the house. You never broke incense for me when I walked in. You didn't even kiss me on the cheek. This woman's kissing my feet. And he says to Simon, to whom much has been forgiven, much love is given in return. So let me ask you, how much do you think this woman is forgiven? And the contrast is very evident. One man there has everything, but doesn't give anything. Because that one man hasn't received a bit of forgiveness in his life. And this one woman has nothing and gives everything she has. Because her heart overflows with the knowledge that she's forgiven. And then at the end of the story, Jesus forgives her again, gives her more. She's already forgiven. It's why she's crying. He says she's already been forgiven. And yet he looks at her and says, woman, you're forgiven. And there's more forgiveness heaped on her as she gives out the praise and the forgiveness. Another message that says you can't outgive God in the forgiveness category, but you can refuse it. And as you refuse it, you shrivel up in how you treat other people. And you don't forgive them their trespasses. And you don't extend grace to them. Another story, Mark chapter 2, verse 5. I actually want to turn over there and read this. A couple of these I just quoted for you because I didn't want you to have to turn and turn. But I hope you're tracking along. Mark chapter 2 tells the story of Jesus sitting in a room. And it's so populated that a group of men tear the roof off of the house and lower a young man by ropes into the middle of the room and he lays on the floor in front of Jesus. This is in a a part of the world where the roofs are flat and a lot of times there would be a patio up top, maybe even a bedroom outdoor. And so they just tear the tiles off and lower the young man in. And in an amazing turn in Mark chapter 2 verse 5, it says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic man, son, your sins are forgiven you. Why do I say that's amazing? Because the text doesn't say he saw the young man's faith. It says he saw their faith. And then he forgave the young man. And did you notice what the young man didn't do before that? He didn't ask for forgiveness. He didn't confess his sins. We don't even know if he's sorry. That rat, you got to be sorry if you're going to be forgiven. We don't know if he's sorry. We just know he's paralyzed. He can't move. And his buddies dropped him into the middle of the room in front of Jesus. And Jesus saw their faith and forgave the young man. Which tells me that it's not a matter of me getting my faith up. It's just getting in the right room. And getting in the right room might not just be physical. It might be spiritual. It might be mental. It might get in the right space and listen to Jesus. Get in the right spot and hear him. Don't bring the right stuff to him. Get in the right spot. Don't sell out with bringing them the right stuff, fixing your life, piling up your offering. No, get in the right space. Here I am, paralyzed, broken. I I don't know, I don't have anything. This is all I have for you. And he says, son, your sins be forgiven you. Now I can get real theological here. I'll only get so deep with you on this on a Sunday morning, but there's a beauty that happens right here that's that's mind-blowing theologically. Jesus doesn't shed his blood. This young man doesn't offer a lamb sacrifice. The cross hasn't happened. The resurrection hasn't happened. And Jesus verbally gives forgiveness of sins without all the things that we Christians say have to happen in order for you to be forgiven. Jesus didn't die on the cross. No bloodshed, no resurrection. And yet, son, your sins. So quit telling God what the rules are. That's the point of this story. Quit telling God what the rules are on how people get forgiven. Well, they didn't say the prayer. Neither did this kid. Oh, Jesus, they didn't talk about the blood. They didn't claim the blood. This kid don't even know about the blood. He, you got to do something. This kid didn't do anything. He didn't even offer up the sacrifice. He didn't even follow Torah, and he got forgiveness. And it ticks everybody off in the room except the kids that brought him in and the kid that got miracles because that's the people that always love grace. The people that hate it are the ones out here trying to pay for it. And so the... the Scribes and the religious leaders and the lawyers and the Pharisees say, 
Who is this that says he can forgive sins? That's blasphemy. And I love Jesus' responses are gold, man. Jesus says, so that you know, he goes, what's tougher to say? Son, your sins be forgiven you, or rise, take up your bed and walk. What's harder to say? Which one's the hardest one to pull off? But so that you know I have power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, son, take up your bed and walk. What's that mean? Well, if I just blaspheme God, there's no way God's going to heal this kid. So, so that you know, I do have power to just forgive who I want to get up. If he gets up, I love this. I love, we don't see this, but you know, this had to be happening. Jesus has to kind of look over at him and goes, if he gets up, you guys all owe me an apology. <laughs> kid, get up. And the kid gets up. What I got lost in when I was coming up preaching was that I, I got lost in the thought, you know, of, a, of that, um, uh, Sin will paralyze you. I got lost in that. So I'd preach that and go, if you sin, it's going to paralyze your walk. And sometimes the only reason why you need a healing is because you've sinned. Listen, maybe sometimes you need a... Sometimes maybe your physical body is in trouble because of your sin. But the point of the story was not, boy, this kid sinned so bad he's paralyzed. The point of the story is the Son of Man... The, Jesus tells you the point of the story. So that you know the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins, I say to you, son... Take up your bed and walk. Jesus has the power for you whoever he wants to. So I don't, you don't have to say a prayer. You don't have to plead the blood. You don't have to be in church. You don't have to get it right. This kid, we don't even know if he had faith. But forgiveness of sins was his. His receiving of it was rising, take up his bed and walk. Because there is something that happens when forgiveness of sins is offered to you. You're invited to run with it. You're invited to get up and take it out. Go do something with what you have received. So, couple principles. Forgiveness requires nothing from you. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Son, your sins be forgiven you. God reconciled the world to himself by not counting their trespasses against them. Right? So I ask you a question then. Why repent? What's the purpose at all? of ever saying anything about your sins. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the Apostle Peter, preaching a message on the day of Pentecost, says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Or in the Greek, for the forgiveness of sins. That's exactly what we're talking about. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Why does Peter talk about repentance and be baptized for the remission of sins? Because Jesus has already given forgiveness of sins, and I need a mind change in order to place myself into forgiveness of sins. And what's baptism? This is why we have to teach these sacraments. So that we understand what is baptism, but me stepping into his death. When you accept Christ, we have a water baptism ceremony. The water baptism is more than just to let everybody know you're getting saved. The water baptism is so that you can do the same thing you do during the Eucharist. You can see the body and the blood broken and shed for you. And the water baptism is you can see that you go down into his death so that you are raised into a newness of life. Which means you died to the old you. To receive forgiveness of sins, you go into water baptism so that you die to all of the things that you don't want to forgive anybody else for. Retribution and reciprocity and payback. You enter into his death. So Peter encourages us to be, by the authority of Jesus Christ, to be baptized in water, change our mind so that we receive the remission of sins because it's us doing the receiving if you don't receive it, you're not going to be able to give it back out. Say, does that mean I haven't been forgiven? No, you've been forgiven, but it doesn't do you any good if you don't open the gift. You need to know it so that you walk in it, so that you live in it, so that you have life and that you have it more abundant. 
so that you recognize what's been done on your behalf. When we repent, we change our mind. What are we changing our mind to? When we change our mind, we're coming into agreement with God. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, probably the most famous confession passage in the New Testament. I spent a decade on the road in itinerant ministry. I did question and answer sessions at, set, at conferences all over the world, and probably 50% of them I got asked about 1 John 1, 9 from grace people because we have the idea we have the understanding that Jesus died once on the timeline and he's not going to die again right there's not going to be a second death of Jesus he died once for all hebrews say once for all past present and future then right all sins in Christ whatever sin you commit today Jesus has already paid for it whatever sin you committed yesterday Jesus paid whatever sin you commit tomorrow Jesus has already paid for it all right once for all so why does 1 John 1, 9 say, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness? Because that causes people to go, well, if we don't confess, then he won't cleanse. And part of that's a misunderstanding of context, and part of that's a misunderstanding of Greek, because this wasn't written in English. And the context is John dealing with people who don't even believe in Jesus. He opens his book with, you don't think he's real? I saw him. I touched him. He's real. And you need to know it. And you are less than you think. You are a sinner. And he said, you need to admit that you're a sinner so that you'll accept this one who has died for you. And that's great advice for all of us. We need to admit what we are so that we can accept the one who died on our behalf and who raised from the dead. And he goes, if you'll confess that, he's faithful and just to forgive you. And in the Greek, cleanse is a word that is constantly happening. It doesn't just start when you confess. It's already happening. And it never stops happening. Cleanse. Progressive cleansing. If I confess, confess is the Greek word homologio. Same word. Homo, same, logia, word. Same word. Say the same word. Say the same word as who? Say the same word as him. What does he say about you? Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. I don't count their sins against them. If I confess who I am to him, if I say the same thing of what he says about me, cleansing, 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 cleansing. What happens if I sin? Cleanse. It's like your car going through a car wash. <sighs> There's the brush. This is the constant cleansing of the Holy Spirit. And you're, you, just, you just keep cleansing. He never stops working, in other words. Forgiveness is not a Sunday morning and go to meeting thing. Forgiveness doesn't hit at the end of a good prayer. Forgiveness is yours. Cleansing is yours constantly. That leads me to a final question then. Why do we say confession is good for the soul? That's not in the Bible, by the way. <laughs> it's not in the Bible to go, confession is good for the soul. Not, not in those exact words. But you know what? The principle actually is in the Word. Because confession isn't just me to God. Confession is me to you. And this is where community happens. This is why the creed says, I believe in the church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins. Because it's inside of the church where I really start to comprehend my forgiveness of sins. James chapter 5, verse 16. Confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. The word confess here is not homologia. It's not say the same thing. It's exomologio. Exomologio is a big Greek word that means confess it with joy. In other words, tell someone what's happened, what you've done, so that they can unify with you together. This is the beauty of community. You know why we confess so that we let go? This is why we confess our sins. We do not confess our sins so God will forgive us. We confess our sins because God has forgiven us. And so we can let go of the things we've been carrying. And we confess them to each other so that we can strengthen the brethren. Now, I'm not encouraging you to go around the room today and tell everybody your deepest, darkest sin. You need to use the wisdom of the Spirit on what you unload on people. Okay? Because sometimes that's all you're doing. 
Sometimes you're not just letting go of it so that you can get healed. Sometimes you're just straight cannon foddering people with your stuff and that doesn't do anybody any good. This is why we need environments of community where we learn to grow together and we learn what we can and cannot, what we can release publicly, but also we have interpersonal relationships where we are strengthened by releasing the things that need released. Forgiveness is mine. Whether I, whether I do anything with it or not, he's already done the work. But if I do something with it, I can let go of the things in my life. And if I receive it and do something with it, I can give it out to other people in my life. This is why confession of sin and praying for forgiveness of sins should still be part of the Christian experience, even in grace, even in grace. Let me explain. Confession of our sin is us acknowledging what's been done on our behalf through, the, through Christ. Confession of our sin interpersonally is also the acknowledgement that we have not yet arrived, we are not perfect, we have baggage, and that we need each other. And confession of our sin is to release us from carrying what we know He's already released, what He's already paid for. I have found, and I, I'm, I'm going to pray with you the prayer of forgiveness in a moment, and, and if you want to pray it with me, I want to encourage you to. The prayer of forgiveness from the Common Book of Prayer... This is a prayer that I've learned to pray frequently, not because I don't, I hope I've laid a good enough foundation for this, but let me say it for the 12th time today. Not because I don't believe I'm forgiven. I pray it because I know I am, but I know Paul White needs to let go of stuff. Like I, I know I carry stuff. I know I'm forgiven, but I keep carrying it. And if I'm not careful, I'll keep carrying it and trying to work through it. Like work on it. Instead of just saying, I'm going to let go of this. I need to let go and receive his forgiveness. And we can get real snobby right here and go, no, he's already forgiven you. I know. But if I don't walk in it, <laughs> what good's that do me? I believe he's forgiven the whole world. I'll just go ahead and say this up front. I don't think there's a person out here right now who hadn't been forgiven of their sins. Once for all, Jesus. So why do I keep trying to tell people about Jesus? I mean, why bother? They're all forgiven anyway. Because if you think the end game is just that people are forgiven, then why are you following Jesus? Why don't you just receive His forgiveness and move on? You follow Him into the way of His life, His resurrection. You want to live the life of God on the earth. I want people to experience life more abundant. Part of that's realizing they're forgiven of their sins. And if you're forgiven, then what's next? What can I walk in if I knew I didn't have to walk in this guilt and shame and fear and condemnation? And the life of God becomes mine. Bow your heads with me if you would. Thank you, Father, for this word today. I hope, Father, that as we've presented forgiveness as a death, death to what I could have received if I wouldn't have forgiven, then we've closely identified with your death. That's my prayer. I pray that as we've presented forgiveness as something that happens, whether we like it or not or receive it or not, I hope that leads us to the awesomeness of how big forgiveness is. But I also hope we don't stop there. I hope introducing that we need to change our mind and confess who we are leads us to realizing that forgiveness of sins is something we need to grab because we live in a world where we've been wronged and we want to be able to offer that forgiveness. And we can't offer what we don't have. We can't offer what we haven't fully received. I pray all of these things have happened today. And Father, as we as a church today pray the prayer of forgiveness, we don't pray this because we don't think you're forgiving us and you're just waiting on us to say a magic prayer. No. We pray it so that we position ourselves into the full knowledge. We repent and put ourselves into the full knowledge of who you are and what you've done so that we can go out here and be forgivers. In Jesus' name.